Thank you, Rebecca. Great job. We appreciate the, uh, the encouragement this morning as uh, we've truly been able to focus on Jesus, uh, truly our Savior, and we're so thankful that um, we can sing about him, we can read about uh, the words that he spoke, and just be encouraged and, and blessed and challenged at times, uh, I believe, as well. Well, you may recall last Sunday we were in Mark chapter 8, and we were talking about uh, some of the, the faithless uh, Pharisees, and there was all these different degrees of faith that uh, it seemed to, we seemed to be encountering. We saw the, the faithless religious leaders, and we followed that up with uh, the fickleness of the disciples, who at times seem absolutely 100% bought into Jesus and Jesus' Messiahship. And then at other times, uh, they were thinking about food, and Jesus is giving illustrations about spiritual things. And and you just kind of wondered where they were coming from at different times. And, and then we encounter this blind man who Jesus heals. And it's a curious thing when Jesus heals this blind man because he heals him and he uses a prop. He, he uses some spittle and anoints his eyes. And so Jesus touches his eyes. And then Jesus asks him a question. And it's kind of off the rails why Jesus would ask such a question. But he asks him, can you see anything? which may seem like a logical question to your eye doctor. But to Jesus and the disciples, there makes no sense of this because this is Jesus who heals from a distance and heals effortless, effortlessly. And the man looks at Jesus and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking around. And Jesus said, well, that's not good enough. And so Jesus uh, anoints uh, the man's eyes again and the man can see. And we look at this and we ask ourselves questions like, what in the world just happened there? Isn't Jesus powerful enough to heal this man just so? Uh, why is Jesus uh, asking and why is Jesus doing a partial healing only to follow it up with a full and complete healing? Well, then we connect the dots. And we see that this man who has this blindness, who partially saw and then completely saw, was very much like the disciples who could see partially at times who Jesus was, and yet at other times they just kind of left you scratching your head. And this illustration that Jesus brings to bear upon the disciples is critical because they are the people who are not seeing completely at what point will they see completely and acknowledge who Jesus is? And that's our passage today. Isn't that wonderful? Here we are in Mark chapter 8. And I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles to verse 27, please. Mark chapter 8, verse 27. And stand with me as I read down through verse 33. Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say you're Elijah, but others one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, and he said to him, You are the Christ. And he warned him not to tell anyone. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. And he said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests but men's. Father, as we turn our hearts to the Word of God this morning, how I pray, Lord, that you would make the Scripture plain, that we would be able to understand it in the purpose of its writing, that we might not only be able to grasp the truth that is here for us, Lord, today, but, Father, that we might as well apply it. Help us, Father, to understand the significance of what we're talking about today. And may you be glorified by the receptiveness of our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 
You know, it's funny, in, in many ways, we're still like children, aren't we? Even though we've grown up and we have adult stuff, adult-sized clothes and all those kind of things. Uh, sometimes the disciples are the same way, but I was thinking of uh, Steve Nemeth's uh, opening when he was talking about the Operation Christmas Child, and he's talking about uh, how many of the children on December 25th are going to open presents, and as they, they open these presents up, some of them are excited to, to get a bike or to, to get a, a video game or something of that sort when the kids across the world don't even have toothbrushes. And I was thinking to myself, we're just like kids, though, still at times, because I thought to myself, I'd be excited if I got a bike this Christmas. You know what I mean? Maybe not an average bike, but, but still a bike. Um, you know, the disciples are like children at times. It just seems like at different points, they fail to grasp the meaning of what is being said. Here we are as we pick this up, and this is a fantastic passage. But the question is going to be asked by Jesus, who do you say that I am, after he first asked the other question, and that is, who do people say that I am? As we're going to see, there were a lot of opinions about who Jesus truly was. And many of those statements that are being made about the identity of Jesus has a direct relationship to what Jesus is doing and what Jesus has done to this point. Remember, how many years was it that Jesus ministered on the earth? As in, as, as in ministry, three years. And so from the time, approximately the time of the baptism to the time of the crucifixion and resurrection, it's about three years. And now we're two out of those three years into it. Jesus has been doing miracles. People have been listening. But there are a lot of people still who are not yet ready to say that Jesus is the Messiah, the sent one from God. And the reason is their reluctance comes from the fact that they had in their mind an idea of what the Messiah would do and what he wouldn't do. Think about it. You're a very proud people, the Jewish people were. You're living in your own land. This is the promised land. I mean, come on, Jesus, uh, you, you've come to the promised land. This is where God said we would I inherit and, and we would be able to live in this great place where, you know, it's just so wonderful. There's just, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's phenomenal. And yet here we are, we're the servants and slaves of the Roman Empire. We don't have the freedom to do what we want to do. Uh, we are heavily taxed by the Roman government, and they have leaders that are over us, and we have to go before them. And any time we get a little bit feisty, they put it down in such a way that's violent and brutal. What a terrible place to live. I've only ever known freedom here in the United States. I wouldn't know what it would be like to live in a country where a foreign government occupied the country and made all of the rules. I live in the United States of America, you've lived in the United States of America, we have freedoms here. We have certain things like our speech is protected, Bill of Rights, isn't that great? So we enjoy all of those different things, but for the people in Palestine at the time when Jesus is there, it's very, very different in Israel. And their image of the Messiah had everything to do with the Messiah coming in and breaking the bonds of their servitude to Rome. You see, in their mind, the Messiah was going to come, and he was going to lift off all of this oppression, and they were going to be free again, and they were going to be restored to greatness. There is going to be a return to the grandeur of Israel, and when you think of the grandeur of Israel, and you think back to the Old Testament, uh, what king do you think of? Oftentimes, we think of David or Solomon, don't we? Those were the great kings, Solomon the great builder, all that wealth and all of that domination. Yes, David was the warrior, but there is Solomon. He, he is able to enjoy all the benefits. He was building palaces and places and so forth and so on. It was a tremendous time, wasn't it? And in their mind, the Messiah would come and he would restore all of those wonders. 
They would have all of those blessings again. And instead, here is, here is Jesus. Jesus has come. And their mindset, they're thinking to themselves, whoa, who is this? Look at the things he's able to do. Look at these miracles. Look at the craziness of all of this stuff. I mean, can you imagine with a word he calms the Sea of Galilee? Can you imagine he's able to heal the, the lame and heal the lepers? He's able to make the blind man see this is not your average person. This Jesus is exceptional. And maybe because of this power that he has, he's the Messiah, he's the deliverer. But now two years have gone by. Jesus is drawing big crowds. Thousands of people come to hear him speak. In fact, we just got through reading about in the Decapolis, him feeding 4,000 men and probably more than 10,000 with women and children. He is able to do all of these tremendous miracles, but where is the military part of it? When is he going to pull out his sword? When is he going to put his helmet on? When is he going to deliver us? Instead, Jesus wants to talk about things like the blessed are the meek. Huh? Blessed are the ones who hunger and thirst after righteousness. What? Will you please just get the sword out? Will you just wave your hand? Will all the Roman soldiers just fall over dead? When is that going to happen? And see, because it didn't happen, there were those who thought, okay, well, this must not be the Messiah. So when Jesus asked the question of the disciples, who do people say that I am? The answer came back, and the first one is, well, John the Baptist? Question mark? You know, the inflection in your voice, John the Baptist? Herod asked if Jesus was the reincarnation, basically, of John the Baptist. He wondered if that was the case. Others would say, no, no, he's not uh, John the Baptist. He must be Elijah. And others said, well, no, 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 maybe he is one of the prophets. And so that's the answer that the disciples heard the others, the multitude, say. It was fine to answer for the multitudes because it wasn't a direct question. But when Jesus turns to the disciples and he says, who do you say that I am? Everything changed and became personal. At this point in time, Jesus is looking in their eyes and he's saying, who do you say that I am? Remember, this comes on the heels of Jesus healing that blind man and lifting off the, the veils that were upon his face. And now he sees clearly, would this be that moment when the disciples would see clearly? Well, even for the devout and even for the dedicated, there were some questions. Take your Bibles, keep your little ribbony thing in your Bible in Mark 8. We'll be back soon. But just go over to Matthew chapter 11, would you? I'd like to read for you there, starting in verse 2. Now, when John, while in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one? Who is the expected one? The expected one is the Messiah. And he says, Or shall we look for someone else? Jesus, are you the Messiah? Or should we st still keep looking? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, deaf to hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have uh, been preached to the gospel to. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. And these men were going away, and Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you see when you went out to the wilderness? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Oh, those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messengers ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. You see, John was exceptional. John, the baptizer, uh, was the one who was promised, that forerunner that would come before the Messiah, who would preach that people should repent, and then he baptized them as a sign of that repentance. And then their hearts were open to their own sinfulness, quite frankly, and their willingness then to accept a, a Savior. And that Savior turned out to be Jesus, who said, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so when Jesus here is, is listening to all of these answers, he's understanding that there is going to be a reluctance because even, no doubt, in John's mind, John did not understand the significance of why Jesus had come. But Jesus is think, or John is thinking that even Jesus, if he is the anointed one, if he's the expected one, then he most certainly is going to come and break the chains of Rome. You see, that was the mentality. That was the thought process. So even for those who are devout and dedicated, there was a challenge here. So what kind of an answer would Jesus receive from the disciples when he asked that question, who do you believe that I am? And Peter, being the spokesman for the disciples, is going to turn to Jesus and answer him by saying, you are, he says, the Christ. You're the Christ. Then he warned him not to tell anyone. This is probably the crescendo in the book of Mark. This is the whole crescendo. It has come to this point where finally the disciples are willing to declare that Jesus is the expected one. He is the anointed one, Christos. Uh, truly, uh, the, the word in the Greek New Testament for Messiah. And Messiah in the Hebrew in the Old Testament meant anointed one. It was used of Old Testament kings when they were anointed to rule. He is this king who has come. And Peter declares that Jesus, this is true. You are the Christos. You are the anointed one. And we as the disciples see this clearly. You see how important a moment this is? This is huge. This is a watershed moment here in Mark chapter 8. It's the pinnacle of the book of Mark. You see that finally they see the truth clearly. How exciting it must have been. I think even Jesus was excited at this point. He's excited that they finally see it, that they're finally getting it. They finally understand that I'm truly the Messiah. Well, it's pretty exciting. But it doesn't stop there. You see, by declaring their faith in Jesus, old things have become passed away, and behold, all things are become new. It's almost like they're now under new management. Have you ever been to a bad restaurant? I mean, like a really lousy restaurant? Like, like, ooh, how do they stay in business? How many have been to one of those kind of restaurants? A whole bunch of you have. Have, have you ever driven past that same restaurant sometime later, and there's a sign across the front glass that says, under new management? You have? How many have seen that under new management? Okay, a whole bunch of you have. How many have gone back then and eaten there again under the new management? Yeah, okay. So, so those of you who are into marketing, all right, you need to change the name of the restaurant. If it was French, make it Italian, all right? You just got to do something totally different or people are not going to come back because I guess when we have a bad experience, we just chalk it up to whatever and we're not going back. So here's the thing. The disciples are now under new management. Everything has changed for them. They are now new creatures, and they're able to digest and accept what Messiah is going to teach them. The second point here that is underscored for us is, what do you understand then, disciples, about the purpose of God? I want to pick this up here in the rest of this chapter. You'll notice that Jesus begins to teach them. Verse 31, Jesus begins to teach them that the Son of Man, this anointed one whom he is, must suffer many things. He's going to suffer many things. Now, do you find that interesting that after they make this grand declaration that we are followers of Messiah, the Most High, the expected one, the anointed one, that Jesus starts to tell them what's going to happen? And Jesus begins to tell them, the Bible says here, in such a manner that um, he was stating the matter, verse 32, plainly. Have you ever talked to someone and you really couldn't understand what they were trying to say, like what their point was or what their position was? Have you ever talked to people like that? Some people are really good at that. They like talk in circles. And you kind of like, ooh, 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 ooh. I hate that, okay? I just really, I'm totally annoyed by it. I just, 
I remember years ago, many years ago, a deacon and I went to see some fellow, and we talked to this fellow, I don't know, quite a while, over an hour, and uh, when we left his house, we were walking out, and uh, the deacon looked up at me with a very puzzled look on his face, and he says, Pastor Kevin, he said, uh, how do you think that went? And I said, well, how do you think it went? He says, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I have no idea. I guess time will tell, right? I mean, it was like, it was really positive and it was really, I don't know, what he's saying. And, and here, uh, there were times when Jesus would teach with parables and it would be distinctly difficult at times to grasp the meaning of some of those things. But now everything has changed. Jesus is looking at these disciples who are under new management and he is going to speak in a matter that is plain and he is going to tell them point blank, this this is what the future holds. And you'll notice here in this passage, he says to them very clearly, I'm going to have to suffer, and I'm going to have to be rejected, and I'm going to have to be killed. Now, there's are three wonderful verbs, I'm, you know, or whatever they are. And, uh, you know, here they are. I mean, he, he, we're, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer, Jesus says. And, and I'm going to be killed because ultimately the religious leaders are going to reject me. This doesn't sit well with the disciples. Can I just say that? I think, and I could be wrong, but I think that the disciples were thinking in their mind that Jesus, now that we understand he's the Messiah, somehow this is all going to work out. Somehow uh, those legalistic Pharisees are going to see that what's important is not what you put into your body, but what comes out. They're going to get it, that it's about spiritual qualities in a person's heart. They're going to get the whole idea of hungering and thirsting after righteousness and not ascribing to a list of legalistic terminology. Somehow those Sadducees who are ripping the people off wildly in the temple are going to have a, a, a come to Jesus moment in the most literal sense and they're going to realize that they're convicted in their heart from stealing from the people. Somehow the scribes and the Pharisees are going to come together and realize that Jesus is the anointed one and it's proven out in the scriptures. He is fulfilling all the scriptures. Somehow they're going to get that. And things are going to be like they're supposed to be. Jesus is going to go up there to the temple and he is going to assume his rightful kingly presence there in the temple and all of the religious leaders are going to encourage the people and they're all going to come and they're going to love Jesus and serve Jesus and anoint him with all of their strength. And Jesus says, no, that's really not the way it's going to be. They're going to hate me just like they hate me now. And eventually, they're going to kill me. Now, no doubt, Peter's thinking to himself, we love you, we don't want you to be killed. It almost seems like the last part that Jesus adds on there, and he says, but I'm going to rise the third day, I'll rise again from the dead. It's almost like that never really registers with them. And even as you go to the end of the Gospels where you have the death, burial, and resurrection parts of the scripture, uh, you never really see them anticipating, oh, the third day he's gonna rise. They just seem to like, not get that part. But as Peter's thinking this through, again, he's the spokesman for the group, but I believe that there's <laughs> continuity within all of the disciples. This just didn't sit well with them. This type of teaching just has no place. And so you find one of the more distressing passages of Scripture where the Bible says that after he got through talking about these things that he was speaking so plainly about, he was sitting, or stating rather the matter plainly, Peter took him, took him aside. Jesus can I have a word with you, please? And the Bible says Peter rebuked Jesus. Whew. That takes some nerve, doesn't it? I mean, seriously. I mean, you've been around Jesus. He is God. You just said so. Why would you rebuke God? For the same reason we still rebuke God, don't we? Ooh. What do you mean? When Peter rebuked Jesus for teaching these things, 
Jesus' reply to him is in front of all the disciples so that the disciples all hear the same thing. When Jesus looks at Peter, he says, what? Get thee behind me, Peter. No, he doesn't. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. Whoa. What do you mean? Now, I want you to see the last part of that verse there because that really is, is kind of what the meaning of this is going to hinge on. When Jesus says for, he's giving us the reason. He says, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but instead you're setting your mind on man's. You see, the interesting part here was that Peter had a plan. He had some goals for Jesus. And this whole idea of being rejected and not assuming the rightful throne in the temple really didn't sit well. And the whole concept of him dying was, oh, you couldn't accept that. And so Jesus calls him out. You see, Satan is very clever. Satan is actually using Peter to try to persuade Jesus not to follow through with the designs of Almighty God. That's what you have in the very beginning when Satan takes Jesus out into the wilderness to tempt him there. Jesus, you can have all of these things. Satan, the, the small g, God of this world, was capable of delivering some promises to Jesus. All if Jesus would just lay aside this whole notion of coming and dying on this cross. And what Peter was doing was he was seeking to influence Jesus under the weight of Satan's own manipulation. It's not saying here that Peter is indwelt by Satan. Don't carry off too many uh, intangibles here that are not mentioned. The reality is what Satan is doing is being influenced by him. Think of the passage over in Philippians chapter 1. And I want to read a few of those verses there in Philippians 1 so that we understand the mindset that Jesus has versus the mindset that Peter had. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affliction or affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, United in spirit, intent on one purpose. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude, or some of the versions would say, this mind be in you. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." For this reason also, God highly exalted him. And the passage goes on. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And what is that mindset of Christ Jesus? You see, Christ was there in heaven. Everything was going swimmingly well in heaven, thank you very much. There's no problems in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? God decided to come down and ransom sinners like you and me. And let's make it very, very clear. God didn't have to do this. God didn't have to do it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Isn't it great to know that God loved us and was willing to do this? Yes, it is. But understand, he was under no compulsion. There was no one, there's no one greater than our God. And so he didn't have to do this, but he does it because he loves us. And it was up to Jesus then, the second person of the Godhead, to come down. And Jesus, the Bible says, had the attitude of love toward us, so he didn't hold on to his throne in heaven and uh, protect his interests. He was willing to come down to this earth and die on a cross for you. 
And he was willing to do that out of his deep love for you. Isn't that phenomenal? That is phenomenal. So when Jesus looks at Peter, he says, Peter, there is a problem, and here's the problem. You're not setting your mind on God's interests, but rather you're focused on your own. Whew. The realization of that is somewhat overwhelming at times, isn't it? I won't ask how many of us have our own interests in mind. Even today as we sit here, there are things that we're interested in. And we oftentimes don't stop to think about the interests of God. You see, God had a plan. His plan was to redeem fallen mankind. God, who is infinite in his wisdom, has plans. And you and I come alongside of our God and submit ourselves to his plan. That's the point. So often, you and I find ourselves in a collision with God. We have a collision with God. I have my own plans. I have my own goals. I have the things in my life that are important to me, and so do you. How do we reconcile what we want to do with what God wants us to do? Well, I can tell you that. We're supposed to submit to what God wants us to do. Our life is supposed to be lived out as true disciples for him. It's a huge point. And we must realize that our God knows far better than us. Amen? If Peter only grasped that truth, if he only understood that, that Jesus is God, and you just said so, Peter, it must be then that God knows better than you what should happen and what it shouldn't happen. I remember a woman that was in our church back in Pennsylvania back in 1992, I want to say. And I remember there was a huge blizzard, and I remember we were supposed to go on vacation, going down to Florida to Disney. And she decided that, well, she was having headaches and they found a little tumor and it had been removed once before, but it had grown back. And they just go up through the nose, clip it, and pull it back out. Not a big deal, but it is on the brain. So I went over and I prayed with her and I said, I feel bad about leaving town while you're having this operation. And she said, no, no, you go. She said, I'll be fine no matter what happens. She said, because I believe Father always knows best. You know, I remember her telling me that through the screen door in her garage. Her husband was a deacon at the church. I'd gone in and prayed with them, and, and uh, I remember her saying, Father knows best. She had bright red hair, this woman. She was Miss Hospitality, head of our missions, and all that, you know. And just a wonderful, wonderful child of God. Father knows best. And as I was driving through the gates in Disney, I got a phone call that father had called her home in the midst of that operation, a routine operation. You say, God, why'd you do that? I don't know, but I know that God has a plan. And I know that my interests have to be submissive to his interests. Peter is being called out and singled out, but not only by himself, it's the disciples as well. They're all being singled out to say, listen, it's not about what you want, it's about what God wants, because now that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, now you're a follower of God, it's about you doing things that are pleasing to God and coming and embracing the purposes that God has. Our God has a plan, and he's calling us to be part of that plan. And the problem, again, for us is that we have, we have so much difficulty submitting our lives to the plans of God. If something goes wrong, we question the wisdom of God. It's the first thing we do. When, when something happens, and, and oftentimes we live out our lives in this, in this way, we, we live out our lives in constant collision with God. Talked about that in the third song that we sang. I give all myself to you, God. But do we really? 
It, it's almost like there's um, levels of discipleship within Christianity. Um, and the church has struggled with this since the very beginning. How dedicated do we need to be to God, really? You know, there's got to be, you know, there's, there's different groups, right? I mean, you know, so we kind of collectively find our own group and they, we kind of settled, you know, well, we're the 75% dedicated group. And then there's, there's those 20 percenters, you know them, right? And, uh, you know, people gravitate to, you know, well, I, I am, I'm 100% in. We sing the song in the church today, but I feel like we know very, very little about what it means to be fully dedicated to our God. To say, God, it's all about your purposes. I'm living life for your purposes, not for my own. But see, if we were honest with ourselves, we would say that we all have goals, we all have purposes, we all have plans, and it's almost like we're willing to fit God into our plans. God, I'm going to invite you into my life, and you can be a part of what I'm doing. Isn't that great, God? That is not the gospel, folks. It's the other way around. God says, I'm plucking you out of the misery of sin, and I'm giving to you my Holy Spirit, and you're now my child. You are bought with a price, therefore glorify God. Oh, I think that's a scripture verse even. You see, you and I now are to be sold out for Jesus Christ. You and I are to be on fire for Christ. It's all about what he's doing, not what I'm doing. I don't say, God, listen, I'm going I'm to include you over here, you know. I, I'm going I'm to bring you in. It's not that. God is saying, I'm including you, Kevin. You need to get it right. The shoe's not on that foot. It was a lesson that the disciples didn't understand yet. But they would learn what the discipleship really is going to look like. Especially when Jesus says, following this, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whew, what does that mean? The symbol of the cross. They need to take up their cross. You and I today, we live in a time, Christianity. Cross is a nice symbol. People wear it on necklaces. We have it in churches. When I said to you, um, what do you think of when you think of a cross? You might say church or necklace, right? I mean, I don't know what else you'd think of. You might think of Jesus crucified. But in their day, when Jesus mentions the cross, it's a symbol of death. And it's death to oneself. We'll talk more about that next week. But oftentimes, we're impacted by our own desires, wanting to go above the interests of God. Let this mindset be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. As we bow our hearts before the Lord this morning, let me urge you today, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, that today you would make that decision to have eternal life through Jesus Christ alone. Maybe you would understand the purpose today for God sending his son to die on the cross. There was no other way. If there was, I'm sure he probably would have taken it. But God had to take upon himself the sin of the whole world. And so Jesus Christ comes and dies on that cross so you and I can have eternal life. The only question is, will you call upon his name? Will you find that forgiveness that lies there at the foot of the cross? in the person of Jesus Christ. If you've yet to do that, let me urge you this morning to call upon his name. Maybe you're here this morning and you've already done that. That's wonderful. But maybe the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to your heart today. Maybe you've been living your life with your own interests in mind, having that be the pinnacle in your life. Maybe God's interests have been secondary. Maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. I'm struggling to prioritize some things in my life right now. It's common, isn't it? It's very common. Maybe you're here and say, Pastor, remember me. Is there anyone at all? You just slip up your hand. God's speaking to your heart today. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Happy to pray. Father, we just so appreciate 
the words here in Scripture that remind us, Father, that you have truly accomplished great things for us. The outfolding of your plan has created a pathway for fallen human beings like ourselves to come and find redemption through Jesus Christ. If there is anyone here today who's yet to find that redemption, may you work in their life to the point where they're willing to submit their heart to you and be saved. And Father, for others, I would pray as well, Lord, that you would do a mighty work. Thank you, Father, for convicting us today. It's so easy, Lord, for us to put our interest above yours. And how we pray this morning that you would work in each one's hearts. Be with these, Father, who have asked for prayer. Take them to new heights, I pray, spiritually speaking. And may you be glorified. We thank you for all that you've done for us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before you run off this morning, let me mention that there are a couple of things that uh, you want to be aware of. Obviously, the big announcement is this Friday, we start with the Fall Bible Conference. So Friday night and Saturday morning and then Sunday morning, uh, all the Adult Bible Fellowship classes will be here in the auditorium next Sunday. And uh, Dr. Steve Silverstein will be our speaker. He's a Christian counselor. Uh, and he's got some great things that uh, he can put in our hearts and minds. And so uh, plan to be with us. You have a, almost like a separate uh, bulletin in your bulletin, and that gives you information on the topics and the times and all of those things. So you don't want to be away for that. Uh, if you can help it, uh, come on out on Friday night. Also want to mention that we're getting closer to the men's retreat in November. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. I was trying to hold off the announcements. I was like, Lord, help me to hold off. Anyway, <laughs> didn't work. Uh, but November 9th and 10th is the men's retreat. And uh, you need to sign up for that now because that closes. That's uh, a little different than the sportsman's retreat that um, we never really fill up. And so this men's retreat does get full. So please uh, sign up today uh, for that. Also want to just mention, too, um, we have new members, uh, Weston and Raven Bethancourt. Are they here today? Yeah, there they are. So welcome. <laughs> so welcome to uh, Faith Community Church. We're glad that you're members. Um, and also just want to mention that we're praying for John and uh, Celia Fletcher, uh, two of our missionaries. They've asked for uh, prayer as they... Um, have uh, many of their teams and workers are in restricted access countries and they're having trouble staying in those places. And so if you'd remember to pray for them. All right. Read your bulletin. There's lots of stuff in there. I'm sure that'll be a help to you. Uh, let's have uh, a word of prayer then together. Let's all stand. And let me mention uh, as you're standing, uh, we're in prayer for Tim Delinka. Tim uh, uh, and Janine um, been members here for quite a while, but Tim was in a serious crash yesterday, uh, last night, actually on a racetrack, um, and I'm getting bits and pieces of the information, but he was a passenger in a car that was in an accident. He was wearing his uh, racing helmet and hit so hard that it cracked the helmet, so uh, not good. They took him via helicopter, and uh, he's in the ICU in uh, Greenville, North Carolina. So if you would be in prayer for, for Tim, uh, Janine and the kids are down there uh, as well right now. So um, just be in prayer um, definitely for him, all right? Lord, we just thank you that we can come to you in prayer for things like this. And we know, Father, that um, uh, we can come and find comfort and strength. And we pray, Lord, for Tim this morning. We pray for uh, strengthening for him uh, there in the hospital. We pray that you'd improve his condition today. We pray, Lord, that uh, he would be uh, treated in such a way that, Lord, uh, he would be well again. And we pray, Father, that uh, you'd be with Janine and the kids uh, and, and be with them as they uh, minister to uh, their dad and husband. Lord, um, again, we thank you that uh, we can come to you in prayer. Uh, we lift up the Fletchers this morning, uh, Pioneers um, organization, uh, missionaries with them, and pray for those folks that are uh, being pushed out of these uh, restricted area countries. We pray the gospel would uh, be protected in these places. The church would continue to thrive even in the absence of your servants at times, and we pray your blessing on it. 
the Lord, uh, we look forward to a week ahead where we can live uh, a life that's pleasing to you. Work in our hearts and minds and help us, Father, to share the same mindset as our Savior that we might desire supremely, Lord, to bring you glory in all things. Uh, work in our, our sinful hearts, Lord, I pray. And ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.